Hi. Welcome to Understanding Business Structures and Should I Incorporate. My name is Patty Strace. I'm the Senior Manager of Social Professional Banking for the BC and Yukon region. I'm a 37 and a half year banker with working in the professional sector for 16 plus years. My current role, I have been working 10 years, which has been working with professional sectors. Today, we're going to be talking about business structures. Those structures are sole proprietor, partnerships, cost share, incorporation, or professional corporations, as they're called. The first one is sole proprietor. Sole proprietor is basically exactly what it sounds like. The practice is usually in your own name. Now, you may have a trade registration, but you must be registered with the government. In order to even open up a bank account for yourself to do business, you must be registered with your provincial government body. Now, what is a trade registration? A trade registration usually means that you are yourself, Mr. or Mrs. or Dr. Smith, doing business as Smith Professional Clinic. Simple as that. Or you could even have it that you're in the Vancouver Center Clinic. It's entirely up to you. With the sole proprietor, you have 100% liability of the finances and of if anything goes wrong, God forbid, you are responsible and you could have your clients come after you for liability. Now, you are taxed at the personal tax rate, which we will talk about a little later on. However, a tax rate is quite sizable, so it leaves you less money within your business. The next is partnership. Now, partnership sounds exactly what it is. Two or more people join together. You share the risk. You share the liability. You also share all the staffing costs, etc. My recommendation to you is that if you form a partnership, that you get agreement. The agreement must be very strong and binding because I liken a partnership as to a marriage. When you're in the honeymoon phase of the marriage or the partnership, everything is wonderful and the partners are getting along very well and life couldn't be better. But if you start to have issues, then it's like a bad divorce. So you have to make sure that you have everything spelled out in your partnership agreement. I'm actually going to give you an example of one of my clients had a partnership go bad. And in that partnership, they fought over flowers for the reception area. It was really nasty, and it ended up in them splitting up and going in their own direction. So that takes us to the next point, traveling in the same direction. You have to want to have the same for your practice. You want to make sure that you both want to have a medium-sized practice or a large-sized practice. How are you going to hire your staff? What do you want your staff to look like at the front end or at the back end? So you have to have the same wants and needs, not only in the practice, but financially. It really makes a difference. In your partnership agreement, you will have a clause in there on how you're going to resolve your differences and should you have a shotgun clause in there. And yes, by all means, you should have a shotgun clause in there in case the partnership goes very, very bad because this is the only way that you can possibly get out. With the shotgun clause, I caution you to make sure that you have actually got the financing in place yourself in case when you call the shotgun clause, your partner, if they can't get financing, and then it finds out that you can't get financing, then things go even worse, and that has happened to clients of mine. So make sure that if you are thinking about the shotgun clause, you have financing available. And I should point out that the shotgun clause simply states that you give your partner notice that they have 30 days to buy you out at a fair and equitable price, which you will state in your partnership agreement. Also, in a partnership, you want to make sure Who's, the, who's making the decisions? Will you both be making the decisions? Who's going to be doing the hiring? Who's going to be doing the firing? Who's going to be responsible for ordering supplies? Who's going to decide the hours of the business, the practice? So these are all very important issues that must be spelled out. 
again, you may have the trade registration. You could have Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith doing business as Eagle Summit Permit. So, again, you must be registered with the provincial body. Now, the one thing about partnerships is you could have some security issues. And by security issues, I don't mean the front door won't lock, but I do mean that it is you may have issues registering your um, loans with the bank. For example, if one of you has dealt with a financial institution since grandma opened you up a bank account when you were born, because most professionals are very, very loyal, and the other really wants to deal with social bank, we may not be able to take the same registration. So these are things that you actually have to work out as well. When a bank registers for your line of credit, you have to have what we call a general security agreement. And two banks cannot hold the same general security agreement on a line of credit. So that's something to take a look at. Now we're going to go into cost sharing. And again, cost sharing is exactly what it sounds like. You have two practices that are running as separate businesses. So you would have Dr. Smith running his own practice, and you'd have Dr. Jones running her own practice. And the thing is, you share common costs. For example, you rent the receptionist, the utilities. I find that most cost share partners, what they do is they set a, they figure out what it is that their costs are going to be for that month, and they put it in a bank account, and then they keep their own money separate. Sometimes I've referred to it referred to as a facility fee. Um, the bad thing about a cost share is you're competing against each other for clients. Now, just as we talked earlier about the partnership, a cost share, you should also have a good written agreement to make sure that everything is the same. Now, with a cost share agreement, you should have this done up by a lawyer, not a notary public, but a lawyer who really understands your business. And if you approach any one of your account managers, small business at Social Bank, they'd be more than pleased to refer you to a few good lawyers so that you can get it done properly. A professional corporation operates the practice. The professional corporation has to be registered with the provincial governing body. In most cases, your professional incorporation name that you choose must be approved by your college, your governing body, and you will then turn around and work for the professional corporation. So you own it, and we find that most professional bodies will say that the professional can own the voting shares of the company and that if you wanted to have your partner or your spouse involved, they could own the non-voting shares of the company. The professional corporation then hires you to work for them. They pay you a salary, and they can also pay you dividends at the end of the year if there are some left over. The professional corporation pays corporate taxes at a much lesser rate. So on $400,000, your tax at 18.6 which leaves you a lot more money to pay your expenses within that professional corporation. So, for example, at 18.62% on $400,000, that would leave you $325,520 to pay all your expenses for the professional corporation. The professional you employee, you do have to pay personal taxes um, on your salary and your dividends that you receive from the professional corporation. And again, your tax at the 46.4%. Dividends are taxed separately. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you do not draw too much, more than you need, or else you're going to have um, to pay higher taxes. Now, the other thing about a professional corporation that I don't have here on the slide that I wanted to share with you today is that you may also have a holding company, and you may also set up a family trust. Now, these are things that you want to talk to your accountant and your lawyer about to make sure that you actually 
do qualify or do require a holding company or a family trust. 